I was hoping uh, today we're, we're trying to do uh, flipping, flipping our training where we're trying to put smaller bite-sized bits of video uh, on our YouTube channel, encouraging people to, to look at those and then come and do more of a and a session. We didn't have time to do that today. I'm, I'm sorry. So um, I, what I would have preferred to have done was to have put the material on PayU, which is the, the tool we use to run the models up on our YouTube channel and allow you to look at that at your leisure and then focus more on Access OM2. I haven't had time to do that. So I was planning as an initial thing to do an intro into PayU. Now, um, I'm, I'm assuming that, that most of the people who are coming today haven't, haven't used PayU or um, the Access OM2 models too much. Um, if that assumption is wrong, please speak up uh, because I don't want to bore you talking about PayU when you, when you already know something about how it, how it works. So I'll assume not. We're going to go through pretty quickly, though, because otherwise we won't have time. So um, feel free to ask questions, but don't stress on the detail of, of this. You can always go back to the YouTube channel and, and, uh, and review what I've said. And also, as I say, hopefully at some point, I'll be putting up uh, easier to digest bits of, of for PAYU training. Um, so, so there'll be two, we'll start with an introduction to PAYU and then uh, we'll go on to the specifics of running Access OM2. So I'll just share the screen and check that people can see that. Can you, is that good, Holger? Yes, I can clearly see. So that's a full screen PAYU window, yeah? yeah? It's, okay. it's just a blue screen with Payu Clement. Yeah, that's good. Great. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, Payu is a Python-based climate model workflow manager. It was written by Marshall Ward, uh, who then went to work for NCI and is now at GFDL. And I've sort of taken over the maintenance and updates for Payu. Um, so it's a climate model workflow manager. It's open source. The code is available on GitHub. The URL is there. I'm sorry. I did mean to put the URLs. Just a moment. Um, I will chat, chat, chat. Where is the chat window now? I, I'm lost. Damn. Um, I was meant to put the URL for these presentations in the chat window. Um, Anyway, I will, I will do <laughs> once I've finished this one. Um, but the, it, uh, this, this PayU demonstration is on the GitHub uh, PayU org organization. Perhaps Holger could find it. It's called PayU course and just put it in the chat window. That'd be great. Thanks, Holger. Um, and there's full documentation, documentation at, the, at that read the doc site. So hopefully you'll be able to get that URL and have a look at the documentation. So everything I'm saying here is already in there. It's just some sort of giving an overview uh, for how it works. So what's a climate model workflow manager? Well, basically it's running your model for you. It's setting up a, a work directory, a temporary work directory, running the model and then moving the outputs and the restarts to an archive directory and then cleaning up that, uh, that temporary run directory and then running again if you've asked it to do so. so it's pretty basic, really. It's just that uh, generally a lot of people write a lot of bash scripts and other things to do all these things, whereas Payu was trying to abstract those ideas, trying to generalize it across multiple models. So uh, some features of Payu, it uses YAML, and its configuration file is usually called config.yaml. So YAML is a sort of simplified markup language, similar to JSON, but a little easier to understand. It has full automatic version control of your experimental configuration using Git. Uh, it has a hash-based versioning system for all model inputs and executables. So it, it, can tr it tracks uh, what, what your model ran with. Um, it supports a bunch of different models. As you, there's a list there, MON5, MON6, XXO, and 2, Access ESM. Um, MIT GCM, some of those sort of fall off the support bandwagon. If people aren't using it, then they may need a little bit of tweaking to get running again. But it's it's used uh, all the time for MOM5, MOM6, Access OM, Access ESM, MIT GCM, and QGCM. Uh, it has a this driver based architecture. So hopefully, uh, you know, you can add support for other models uh, if, it's, if it's required. 
Uh, it's just called Paiyu because it was called Python on Vayu. That's what Marshall called it. Doesn't mean anything special. Um, anyway, so to use Paiyu, uh, you we you, you use the um, the CMS Conda environment that we provide on HH5, and you add the path to our uh, modules on HH5, and then module load Conda. So Conda has a bunch of Python packages, and one of them, one of them is Paiyu. So that's where you pick it up from. To invoke Paiyu, well, it's just Paiyu, P-A-Y-U. If you do minus H on the command line, it'll give you some useful help, uh, a useful help message with and, and lists um, uh, the sub commands. So Paiyu has an architecture where you say Paiyu and then space and then given a sub command. So these are the sub commands here. Just briefly, uh, the ones you use most most um, often would be uh, init, setup, sweep, run, and collate. So Paiyu space init, Paiyu space setup. So init will initialize uh, laboratory directories. I'll get back, I'll get onto those uh, later. Uh, setup will initialize the work directory. Sweep will remove that and, uh, and the logs that accumulate. Uh, run, Paiyu space run will run your model, submit it to the PBSQ and run it and collate will join um, your tiled outputs. So some models tile their outputs and restarts, not all. And so if, the, if your model does this, collate can uh, join those together offline. Um, that's quite useful for mom type models. If your restarts aren't collated and you want to uh, uh, change your resolution or something, you need to collate your restarts so you can just do that offline, but that is that's generally done as part of the model run, but it is exposed as a separate as a separate sub command. The less well used ones, list archive, um, gh setup, GitHub setup, and push. Um, we may have time to go into those, but you almost never use them except if you want if you want the GitHub support. I personally don't use the GitHub setup stuff that Marshall wrote for Payu. Um, so if someone does and they find problems, please let me know, or if they find it useful, then I'm more than happy to uh, make sure that it, it keeps on working, but I don't test it a lot. So uh, please let me know if it's not working. So uh, Marshall also made a, so you can do pay you space push, which is effectively the same as a Git push. So it's important to realize that your configuration directory is a GitHub, is a Git repo. So you can do all the normal Git commands that you're used to doing, Git log, commit, push, um, but uh, pay, uh, Marshall also put in a, um, a separate pay you push command. Um, sorry. And so each of those sub commands, you can also invoke with a minus H. So in this case, pay you space run minus H I put in there and it gives you the usage, the options that you can use for the run command. A lot of those have got to do with setting paths that you would otherwise might set in the config.yaml so aren't that useful but two two in particular for the run command is minus n uh the number of runs which is the number of runs you want number of times you want it to to resubmit and force minus f which just makes sure that the the that pay will run even if there's already a work directory in place if there's a work directory pay you will not run it will sort of stop you from uh, deleting a previous run that may have fallen over or for whatever reason. So you have to force it to, to do that. Otherwise you do pay you sweep, pay you run does the same thing. So pay you run minus F just takes care of sweeping away the old work directory for you uh, if you want to run. So uh, on to cloning experiments. The, the very best way to copy an experiment, an existing experiment is to clone it. So you can clone uh, from a GitHub repository, Cosima, the Cosima GitHub uh, organization has a number of supported configurations, which I'll get to in the next uh, presentation. But uh, so you can git clone those from a URL, but you can also git clone from an existing uh, repository, so an existing experiment. And that's the best, it's always best to clone because it copies everything that you need and everything and doesn't copy anything you don't need. It also retains the history from the previous experiment. So in the Git log, and that's really useful. So then you fork off, but you've still got all of the, all the information about what the previous experiment up to that point uh, had done. Um, 
you can also add other files uh, to your repository. So um, uh, if you have uh, say a, a Python script that generates some input, input uh, data or, or something along those lines, something that you want, even some documentation that you want to, to stay intimately associated with this experiment, then you can just add it to the um, Git uh, repo and commit with a commit message and and it'll and Payu will continue to to keep that in the repo and if you make any changes to it we'll add them automatically when it does it it's automatic commits so um, so this is an example uh, we'll get onto specifics for access on too but it's still probably worthwhile using paying attention to the this is a simple example because it's just a very simple mom model so that it's not too confusing to begin with so this is an example how how you might uh, clone um, uh, an experiment. So I would recommend in general to keep your experiment control directories, these are called in your home directory. Your home directory on Guardi is backed up. Uh, all the other disks aren't backed up, scratch and gdata. So that, that saves you a bit if something bad happens, you get a disk crash, you've still got all of your control directories, you can rerun things. Um, and so Payo was designed with this in mind to be able to store your uh, experiment control directories in one place, a backed up place like home, but have all the large data files, the outputs and everything in a separate location, in this case, uh, Scratch. So in this, so I typically would make a directory called Payu and maybe one um, name for the model type I'm using and then clone into that. So if you, in this case, this git clone command, We'll, cl we'll clone from uh, the payu.org. It's got an example um, experiment there called bowl one. And by, de by default, it will be, be called bowl one because you haven't given it another name. If you want to rename, give it a different experiment name, then you'd have to append that a different name after it, after the git clone. But uh, it's, the reason you might want to do change the name is that names have to be unique uh, for the model type, basically, or well, maybe I'll get onto that in a bit, but uh, you can't really have the same named experiment in more than for the same model. It will get confused. So that's called the control directory. So uh, after you've you've done that, I mean, and you can you're more than welcome to do this while you're, while you're listening. But uh, once you've uh, cloned that experiment, this is what it looks like in a tree. Um, representation. So it has uh, a config.yaml, which is the payu control file in the YAML format. And in this case, it's a mom model. So it has uh, four configuration files. It's a quite simple. And then it also has a manifests directory. You don't have to have a manifest directory always when um, sharing experiments, but that gets created automatically generally. So we'll probably be in there. So the uh, that's what your experiment looks like, your control directory. Um, and this is what the experimental configuration looks like. This is the config.yaml file. And in this case, they say it's nice and simple, it just has three different sections. It's got, they don't have to be in any particular section, but it's just organized this way. So uh, hash is a comment character. So this is just the PBS um, options. So the queue, the number of CPUs, wall time, memory, the job name, Job name is the name is default to the same as your experiment name. So you don't have to specify that, but if you wanted to give it a name that meant more to you in the queue, you could do that. Anyway, um, that's just what shows up in the PBS queue. The model, the model section is defining what model is running. That's, you have to, you have to give it that information. Um, this is an input directory where it expects to find input data and this is their path to the executable. So this is set up, I set this up so that anyone can clone this and run this straight away because these paths, as long as you're a member of HH5, those you can read that data and, um, and so you should be able to just run this model. So if you clone it and you CD into it, then you can just run it and you do it with pay you space run. Uh, the model will then, the pay you will, will submit that to the queue once it starts running, it will do the setup, create a work, directory, this ephemeral directory um, in the laboratory. 
and then it will create a symbolic link in your control directory to that work directory in the laboratory. And then once it's finished, uh, completes without error, and then it cleans up, runs, uh, moves the output files to the to an arc, the archive in the laboratory, the restart files to a restart directory, and um, and deletes the work directory. Um, so these are the these are typically the sort of files you'd expect to see. Uh, so for mom, you'd you'd see these uh, an output and an error file. So that's the standard out and standard error stream from the model. Those appear in the control directory when you run the model and then should disappear once the, once the model is complete, they'll be moved to the output directory and you can look at them there. But it does mean that you can check the status of your model run just by looking at the output file. So for access OM2, this will be, these are named for the model. So it would be called access OM2.out, access OM2.air. Once the model, once it's run, once it's run, whether it's run uh, successfully or not, um, once it's finished, the previous output files will appear in the control directory and they stay there until you do a sweep. So they will sort of collect in the control directory and you can get quite a lot of them. So sometimes it's good to do pay you sweep and they'll get moved into a log, PBS logs directory inside the archive. Then, so once it's, once it's actually finished running successfully, you should get an archive and an output directory in your, sorry, an output and a restart directory in your archive and the manifests will get updated. Um, so as, as I say, to, to, get, to get rid of all the log files that, that accumulate per use space sweep, if you want to start from the beginning, if you've made a mistake and you just want to start um, with a fresh start, you can do pay use space sweep space dash dash hard. That will remove everything, the outputs, the restarts, the logs, the archive, the whole lot. And it, and it won't ask you for permission or anything. So make sure that you really want to do that before you do it because it, it'll just, it'll be gone and it's not backed up. Um, so, sorry, then, so this is the anatomy of an experiment. So I've talked about the control directory is in one place and the um, outputs of the work and the rest of it in another place. Well, so this is, this is what's called the, the control path and the, and the laboratory. So the control is where you are the whole time you've, cloned there, you, you change your configuration files there. And the laboratory is this other space that PayU puts things uh, and uh, links to them from your control directory. So by default, the lab, it's called the laboratory and by default it sits in scratch project user model. So um, the project that you run, uh, the run PayU with, um, and that's that defaults to your default project your username and then the model name. So mom access OM2. And, and that's where Payu puts everything and expects also to find some things in some cases. So, um, so the, the laboratory contains these five subdirectories. Um, subdirectories, archive, bin, code base, input, and work. So the archive is where it puts the, your outputs and your restarts from your model runs. So within that archive directory, there'll be a subdirectory that's named for your model. Um, so in this case, it was mom1. So there would be a directory in there called mom1. Under there, there will be uh, uh, restart and re uh, restart 000, output 000, restart 001, output 001, and it just keeps on incrementing those numbers. And that's where all your outputs and your restarts are. Um, the work, directory has again has subdirect pay you creates a subdirectory under there named for your model and that's where it puts the ephemeral work directories and it, and when the things finished when your runs finished it deletes them again so if you had no failed experiments there would be nothing in there unless you were running a model uh, and you can safely delete anything that's in there but that's what the pay you sweep command does for you the input and bin directories are just sort of convenience places convenient places where you can put inputs and binaries and that's where <clears throat> Paiu, one of the places Paiu will search for them. Uh, it means that you can use smaller paths in your configuration. So you, you don't have to put the entire path to the executable or the input directory. You can just um, put the name, whatever the name is, that's below these, these directories, however, you know, however nested that is. Those are useful. We in the XSOM2 space, we generally not don't use them because we want to have them in um, 
have all those things in common locations so that we don't duplicate uh, inputs and all the rest of it. And executables, excuse me. So um, they don't generally get used for the access on two models, but that's what they're for. Codebase uh, was to support the building of models automatically, but we don't really do that anymore, but it's a good place to put uh, source code and that's where the access on two model uh, the sort of uh, top level repository has has a has the code that's where it includes the code in there as well uh, just to be able to uh, publish an entire model suite but in general there won't be anything in there so once you have cloned your control directory and you uh, and you cd into it you can you can type pay you space in it minus well Minus M mom will create the mod. You don't have to be in a control directory, but if you do pay you in it and inside a control directory with a mom control file con config.yaml, it will create those files, all those directories for you. Um, and the first time you run, it will create them anyway. So um, you don't need to go and make them. So configuring your experiment, as I say, you have to have a model. You, the name is by default the same as your experiment control directory. Experiment directory, control directory. The executable defaults to something that's set by the driver, but in general, the access on two models, the, the executable is defined, uh, the path is defined, and the in, you must have their model inputs. And those can be any number of uh, directories uh, set with a, just with a dash in front. You can have a single one or a bunch with, with dashes in front. And, the, and those are all the places that um, Payu will go to find inputs. Those paths, yes, can be absolute or relative to the lab path, laboratory. Mm, anyway, so the scheduler configuration, well, won't spend too much time, but uh, you can specify the queue, the project, the job name, wall time, and number of CPUs in the memory. The project's been the one that you're most likely to be changing, I guess. Uh, people will run under multiple projects depending on where the uh, resources are available often. And if you do that, um, then you should specify your short path, which we'll come to in a sec. Um, CPU requests, just briefly, uh, pay you, as soon as you use more than a single node worth of CPUs on Guardi, PBS will require you to uh, always request a nodes, uh, increments of a nodes worth of CPUs. So they've got to be a, a device, the number of CPUs you request has to be a, um, an in integral divisor of the number of CPUs per node. So uh, Payu will take care of padding your imp your PBS request to make sure that it's that that it satisfies um, PBS that PBS requirement. So always ask only for the number of CPUs your model requires, and Payu will make sure that that number is is a multiple of the number of CPUs if it's greater than the node size. Uh, you don't have to specify the memory. If you don't, Payu will use this default memory to just request all of the memory uh, for a node or whatever fraction of a node you're using. Right, so if you do use the broad well queues, then you do need to put this little snippet in your config.yaml to tell uh, Payu that you're on, that you're using a node that doesn't have um, the default number of CPUs or the default memory. That memory actually should probably be Bigger, but anyway, um, but that's if you're using the board well queues. Currently, none of the models are de designed to use that, but I believe Andrew was saying the one degree may start using broad well. Anyway, so the work directory. Um, if you run pay you setup, not pay you run, but if you've if you clone the thing and you're on clone an experiment and run pay you setup, this will create the work directory in your laboratory in the laboratory, so often that remote location, and a symbolic link in your control directory to the work directory. So this is that's what it looks like uh, in this case for this simple MOM model. Um, so the reason Payu setup is one of the first steps that Payu will do once, the, once your submitted run starts running on the PBS queue. It will, that's pretty much the first thing it does is, is set up. We expose it as a, as a separate command so that you can uh, test whether your set, whether your configuration is correct. So if there are paths that you can't read or are incorrect in your config.yaml, you do pay you set up, it will tell you that it can't, that that's a problem, and then you can fix it and and uh, and run it again, or sweep and run it again. And so that's a good way of just checking that everything was working. It's also a good way of finding out 
what's happening with your model because the work directory gets created and then destroyed you can never examine its state unless the model's running so you either wait around for the model to run and then examine it and it might go away again so it's just a nice it's nice because then you can see exactly what it's doing so in this case this is the work directory and you can see what payo has done is copied the your control files and your config.yaml into your work directory now um, the config.yaml doesn't need to be in the work directory it's it's done as a sort of documentation process that that was has some history from before pay you used git so it's not strictly necessary but it does mean that your um, config.yaml is is also in your output directory so if you do if you lose con the connection between your uh, control directory and your outputs and they get copied somewhere else at least that information is still there and in the same way the manifests are copied in there even though they're also um, part of your git control repository you get repo in your control directory they're also copied in there as a as a extra documentation process i suppose so so those things are copied the in in this case mom expects its inputs to be an input subdirectory so that's what the driver has done and then it's it's made symbolic links. So these are all symbolic links to locations in the um, in the in the file system. So in this case, there's there, there are these two inputs, um, and but there are these restarts. Now, um, every time you run and you run it, get the new run, then it'll be picking up new restarts. So this is restart 000, we ran again, it would be in 001. And so these are symbolic links and there was also a symbolic link to the, um, the executable that, that's running your, that you're running the model with. Um, and that, again, that's to help you understand so that you can make a work directory and go, and you can see all of the things that the inputs, the restarts and the, the executable that's going to run it, run the model. Um, and it's also because that's how we track them in the manifests, which I'll get onto later. So um, sometimes your config files are copied in there and modified as well. So and sometimes name lists require some alteration for runtime or whether it's a restart run or a uh, fresh run. Yeah, there's different models have different requirements. So, um, so those config files are sometimes altered by PayU. Um, so they won't look exactly the same as the config file that's residing in your control directory in, in some cases. Um, but that again, that's a useful thing because you can see what PayU has done. If you're doing PayU setup, you can look at a difference between your configuration, between those control those config files and go, oh, I see, right, PayU has made this change to this uh, nameless file, for example. Um, so that that was this is another example of a simple configuration just so that you can see you know this is a mom6 model um, has two input directories i would say uh, another point i didn't say before the input these are input directories so because they don't have a full path it's expecting to find them in the laboratory so you know scratch uh, whatever project username mom6 input om4 underscore grid will be one of the directories in there pay will go into that direct will go look in that directory and symbolic link everything that's in that directory into your input directory that's just the way it works uh, so it's a good idea not to put a lot of cruft and stuff that you're not actually using in the model because pay will just link to it and also include it in its manifest and if it's not really something that's in the model then that's just confusing uh, for people who are maybe examining it later or yourself examining it later um, and again, this executable doesn't have a full path, so you would expect to find it in the laboratory bin directory, and if it doesn't, it will complain. This is an example of a more complex configuration. We, we'll, we're going to be looking at access arm too, so we won't bother with that. So some features of Payu. You can do multiple runs. Um, so Payu space run space minus n space 20, for example, will run the model 20 times. It'll, um, it'll submit the model, um, it'll run it, it'll finish, the job will finish, and, uh, and then it'll resubmit again. And because it knows, then it, it will pick up the restarts from the archive, it knows that, that it's already run before, it'll use those restarts, the driver will 
um, examine the configuration files and change them if it needs to. PayU will save every output, but only every fifth restart by default. So that means uh, you'll have restart 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then um, Nick, when you run, um, when it saves restart 0, 6, it'll delete restart 1. And then 7, it'll restart 2. <laughs> and then by the time you get to restart 11, you'll have restart 5, and then 5 restarts before all then. So um, because you just don't need to keep every restart necessarily, it's just so that you can go back and start your model at a certain time. Some people do want to save every, every restart or save at a different frequency, and then you can use this restart underscore frequency and say how often you want to save restarts. If you, in some cases, you want to run, in some cases where a model is quite short, uh, runs quite quickly, um, much much less time than the maximum time that the, the, the you're allowed to submit a job on the queue at NCI, then you may want to run the model multiple times for each job for each P, uh, PBS submission. Um, so you can do that with this runs per sub uh, option. So in this example, runs per sub colon five, it will run the model model five times for each PBS submission. The total number of times, the maximum number of times it, it's run is, is specified by the run, this minus N option. Runs per sub will just, will just run it that many times per um, PBS submission. That was more useful on Ragen when the queues were quite busy. Guardi is uh, a little bit undersubscribed now. Queues weights are pretty, pretty short. So you, it's a little less useful, but once Guardi becomes more uh, well utilized, it may be that your queue time becomes a significant fraction of your runtime. And if you have the ability to run the model multiple times per submit, then maybe you want to do that. So the one degree model, I think it's an hour and a bit or something. I uh, can't remember now. A um, few hours. So, but you can probably run that model for 24 hours. I think the limit might be for the number of CPUs. So, um, you know, you could run it 10 times per submit. So uh, it's just, it gives a bit more flexibility. It doesn't work for the larger models. They generally are limited by their, their queue limit. The time they can spend in the queue, they can spend running is, is much smaller because they use many more CPUs. And that's a limit that NCI, um, uh, the NCI has. Right, path control. You can set the short path. And that's what I suggest people do if they run a model under more than one project. If you don't set the short path, then it, Payer will expect to find the laboratory in the default location, scratch project user. And if you start using, run, if you change the project that you're using, that you're running the model with, with a project colon project code in the config.yaml, then it, will, it won't find it, fi won't find the existing experiment because it will, will be looking in a different laboratory. So if you do run in, under multiple projects, you should set the short path in this case, so it would be short path colon slash scratch, and then the project code you want to save your files under. Um, that, yes, there, anyway, you, you can explicitly set a laboratory path. So say by default, it's scratch project user model name. You can set the short path, which sets that scratch project bit, or you can set the whole thing um, to, to anything you like. And that would mean you can do that if you wanted to run multiple, have different laboratories for the same model effectively, um, and separate them. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, you can get yourself into a bit of trouble. But anyway, you can also set the control path, but uh, don't do that. MPI support um, is pretty limited. I mean, it, it it's just explicit. You just, uh, if you needed to change these things, you just have to give it what the run command is or the flags are. Don't change this unless you know what you're doing, basically. So just leave it would be my, my suggestion. But you also have some user script support. So it has, um, they're like little hooks that'll run things, run commands at certain uh, points in, in the run cycle in its setup run error. Um, anyway, uh, the Access OM2 model does use some of those and I will get onto that. But and PostScript also it also uses and that's that's run every time the model finishes or if you do a collation after the collation is finished, 
and the XSOM2 models use that to be able to automatically sync data to uh, a shared location in, on GData. Um, that's one of the use, uses, use cases for that. If you want to find out what models it supports, pay you list, um, but as I say, don't necessarily expect that to always um, be working for some of the less well used models. So file tracking is a super important part of uh, what Payu can do. It tracks all of the files that are in, used in the input for each model run. Uh, it's completely automatic. You don't have to do anything with the manifests. You never have to touch them. It will just update them if they need to be updated and save that in the um, in the repo, in the uh, Git repository. That's the control directory, control rep repository. Uh, it Payu only knows about files that are in the work directory. So if you've put a, a hard path to a file that's somewhere else in the in the file system, Payu doesn't know about it. It can't track it. Don't do that. Um, we've set up the access OM2 um, experiments to not do that. And if you change it, then that's a bad thing. Uh, you can reproducibly run previous experiments. It's not something that people generally do, but it there is an option to be able to say only run if all of these hashes, if all the, the files haven't changed. So that allows, gives you some ability to say, am I running exactly what I was running before? You can share experiments more easily as all the input file paths are specified, if, particularly if they're in a shared location, which is what the access OM2 Cosima uh, people uh, configs do. There's some flexibility within, with specifying the input path, but that's not so important. Uh, and you can, you know, identify runs using uh, specific files that's not done automatically. Maybe that's something we'll be looking at in the future, but you can interrogate the Git repository um, and be able to determine you know, what files were used in what experiment. And as an example, at one point when I first started this job, there was a dodgy aerosol file. No one had any idea which experiments had used it uh, and still don't. Right. So um, this is really useful stuff, particularly if you if you need to find that sort of information. So what's tracked? Well, executables, inputs and restarts are tracked executables. So there are three different three separate manifests. And that's because they're sort of fundamentally a little bit different. Um, executables don't change very much, but it does mean that you know which executables, you know, the hash you know which executables we executables we used for each experiment. The inputs are more likely to change maybe. Um, well, anyway, but restarts change every time. Every every run the restarts manifest will get re um, repopulated because the restarts by definition change every time. Um, so how is it tracked? Well, it uses this YAR manifest. It's a YAML based manifest file module thing I wrote. Um, it uses the YAML format, same as a config.yaml. Each file, and it's usually a symbolic link in the work directory. So not, not the config files, they're, they're directly tracked by Payu, but each of the inputs that are usually symbolic links is a dictionary key in a manifest file. And the manifest files are tracked by Git. They're just text files. And so the unique hash for every tracked file is associated with each run using this version control. So what does that mean? Well, the this is an example of just a an executable uh, manifest file and has a header, a uh, few lines to say what it is. And then each, each, of, each of the files is one of these keys in a dictionary, it's called. So, um, and it's the path inside the work directory. So that's ephemeral. It doesn't exist most of the time until you make us do you pay your setup, but it, but it unique, but it, it's unique. Um, there can never be more than, it's never more than one thing with the same name in that work directory. And then each one of those has a full path. So that's the path to the file in the file system. So you can find it again. And that, that means that um, the access OM to the Cosmo people can publish configurations with these full file paths and you can just take them and run them. The other thing it has uh, is hashes. So it can have uh, pretty much an unlimited number of hashes. In this case, it's got two hashes, bin hash and MD5. Um, what does that mean? Why does it have multiple hashes? Well, this is what it does. It supports a hierarchy of hashes. So um, it would take too long to always run things like MD5 or SHA128 hashes on very large input files and restart files, particularly to the, the 0.1 degree. Um, it, it's just not feasible. 
So uh, just a quick explanation, hashes, for those who don't know, are a way of uniquely identifying um, data by uh, running it through the um, special mathematical functions that create a, um, a unique signature for each, each file. And that's what uh, Git uses um, with its Git commit hashes. They're, they're sort of ubiquitous in computer science but they do take quite a long time to calculate on very large files. So we need a method to be able to not do that unless we have to. So fast, so we have this fast hashing idea. So the bin hash that, you, that was in the previous, so bin hash is a, it's not a true hash. It's a, it's a change detection hash, if you like. It's not unique, but what it does do is allow us to quickly determine whether a file has changed whether it's modification time change, it's size. Um, and so it detects change. And then if that unique, if that, if that hash has changed and it goes, hmm, okay, I'll run the more expensive hash. So it's this, so that's a way of being able to have our cake and eat it too. We can have unique cryptographic hashing MD5 to identify, uniquely identify our files, but we use this fast hash just to check whether we need to do that every time. So the input directory, the input manifest, all those hashes are pre-populated. Unless something changes, it won't have to um, uh, recalculate the, um, the expensive hash every time. Um, so, yeah, so that's, so we're, we're tracking all of the files that everything that goes into our um, experiments, which is great. Um, forking and sharing. Uh, look, I don't think I think we've we're running out of time. So what I plan to do at this point is go back, go on to um, one speci uh, specifically about our access OM two models and configurations. Okay, um, so running access OM2 models at NCI. So we'll just go through what's in the model, the configurations, running the model, and maybe hopefully some useful stuff after that. So the access OM2 model suite includes 1.25 and 0.1 degree global ocean sea ice models forced with atmospheric data um, and almost identical model parameters. Um, there is a single access OM2 repository with all code and all configs, and that's the URL there. It is, um, and there's a wiki on the Cosima access OM2 repo with lots of useful information. That's where you should go to find out, find out things. That's where I got a lot of this information from. So the components of the model, it's got an ocean model, MOM5, it's got size 5 it's its ice model, and it has uh, um, LibAccess OM2 and, a, and another component called Yatim, and that is the atmosphere component, and it's all coupled together with Oasis. So all the code, it's open source, it's all available at those URLs, but three of them at Cosimo, and one of them in the Mile Motion um, organization. The, the atmosphere is not a free running model, it's sourced, it's forced from a data source. So that's the LibAccess OM2 plus the Yatim, um, reads the data in and passes it to the ice model through the and through the coupler, and then that's passed through the the ocean. The atmosphere uses a, this JRA fifty five reanalysis derivative product called product called JRA fifty five do version one point four. Um, it's there are there are two two ways of forcing the general that are supported: an interannual forcing, which is just the entire um, forcing period from 1955 to, to present day, and that's generally looped, so run for 80 years. <laughs> Can I do some maths? 75, um, and then um, and then start it again. Or there's a repeat forcing, repeat year forcing, which is uh, a clump, which is a single year's worth of forcing from end of May. To the, to the next May of, from 1990 to 91. And that's, that's so that you can just have a forcing that just is, can continue on uh, for hundreds of years without having to sort of change again. And it's, 
it was chosen because it's a relatively stable, hopefully not too global warmy period. Sorry. Um, and there were two other repeat year, 84, 85 and 03, 04, but those aren't generally used now. So the configuration, so all model configurations are global and there are three, those three supported resolutions and the interannual annual and repeat year forcing for each of those. So the one degree is generally called, the Cosmo model name is access 0 and 2. Um, it's one degree and has the, the RYF and IAF forcings. And those are, those are the URLs for the repositories. Those are control directories, which you can clone and start running. The quarter degree is called access OM2-025. Again, it's quarter degree global and has the JRA 55 RYF and IAF. And again, two more pay you config control directories. And the, the other one, the last one is access OM2-01. That's a 0 0.1 degree global. And again, has the IAF and RYF uh, configurations. So those are all available on at the Cosima um, GitHub organization. So to run the model, you should follow the quick start instructions in the Access OM2 wiki. Um, again, I'll share all. The, I will share these. Um, this will this will be uploaded, and I'll sh I'll send um, a URL for this anyway. But it's on it's on the Access OM2 repo in the wiki. Get started the quick start guide, and this is basically what it says to do. Uh, model you well you got to use you must be able to load the conda module with payu uh, first you get clone the url the the experiment you want to to run in this case it's the one degree iaf uh, configuration and you can cd into that directory and then if you do that this is this is the directory listing that you get so um, it has access om2 name list file that's a control file for the access om2 model it has subdirectories for the atmosphere for the ice and for the ocean and so um, so for example this this ocean subdirectory will look very similar to the mom the simple mom model which we sh i showed you before data tab it's got these uh, four configuration files or three um, an input nameless file. So each of the models has their own subdirectory with their configurations inside. In this case, you can see that some other stuff has been added, some documentation, um, some metadata, and um, and a readme. So these are all, and some some scripts for for doing some things like syncing data and and uh, tidying up restarts. So that's an example of how you can add those extra things to the repository and they come along when you clone it, which is great. So that's that's what it looks like. Um, the, so the libaccess OM2 name list uh, um, file, access OM2.nml, controls the logging, the times, the, the model time step, the forcing dates, and uh, the restart period is, is how long the model runs. Um, so that's, that is the the file that you're likely to change, I guess, if you want to change how long the model runs, um, change the time step, it will be an access om2.nml. If you wanted to run the model as a test, you can change the runtime from five years to one month by changing restart period to that in access om2.nml and pay your space run and the model will just run um, as long as you are a member of the appropriate groups. So I'll get onto that in a sec. Um, Payu prints the command it submits to the to the queuing system and some other information. So this is an example of when I, I did Payu run space minus F. Um, and so, so you see here it says um, there are 47 un, unused CPUs, so it's padding the request from 241 to 288. Well, that's really great. Thank you, Payu. Uh, but as um, Andrew pointed out, that means there's 47 unused CPUs. So, so that's not super efficient. There's probably a better way of, of uh, laying out the models or using a different queue. Um, it tells you that it's loading some manifest files, but then it does this queue sub command. Now this is quite useful. Sometimes if you have a problem, you can just, just check that, check that the path. So it's, it prints the payu path here. 
as part of it, it uses it uses environment variables to to send this information through to Paiyu. And so it, it, you can see the path that it's using. Make sure that check that that's the one you think it should be. Um, some other things to to note is the storage. These are it's a classic one. Um, NCI now requires you to, to specify all of the G data and scratch uh, storages that aren't default that you need to use to run your model. Paiyu mostly takes care of this for you. It examines the manifests and the um, and a few other configuration options in the config.yaml and checks for any of these paths and then adds them automatically. So you shouldn't have to, but just sometimes if something's going wrong, it's worth just checking that that's working properly. Um, and that's also a useful thing to cut and paste to send to help if something's going wrong. Say so this is what my this is what Payu did, and so we can check whether those things are correct. Um, so again, uh, this is these are the options, the various options from that config.yaml for the one degree IAF just split up into the um, different sections, so you can so it's easier to read, but uses the normal queue, three hour time limit and a gigabyte of memory. These are the model options. So it's a bit hard to see on the screen, but um, make it a bit bigger. So um, the model name is XSOM2. It has the model, the XSOM2 is a sort of quasi model in itself. So it has its own input directory, which is this one here. And then it has all these sub modules, which are actually the um, uh, doing the science, I guess it's the best way to put it. So the, the Yatom, the atmosphere model, um, has a path to the directory and it has all of these input directories. It's a bit ugly, but that's because now it's taking input from um, the input for MIPS project uh, at NCI you know, under QV56. And this is just the way it lays it out. So we have to put all these directories in separately for all the different forcing fields. Nonetheless, it's all done for you. Um, that uses one CPU, so that's just the the part that reads in the atmosphere and feeds it the atmospheric forcing data and feeds it to the models. There's the ocean model, MOM. Again, it's got an executable path and an input path, just one directory for each of those. The ICE model is similar, so 216 CPUs and 24 CPUs. I'll just point out now, you can see in the executable path the way that um, Andrew uh, Kish has set up the, the build scripts for Access OM2, it includes a hash for the code for the Access OM2 um, code base itself, as well as a hash for the for the LibAccess OM2 version. So it's possible to to uniquely identify the code that was used to run the model from this, and also this is included um, in the manifest. So you can use the manifests to check. Um, what version of the code you're using. It has a collation step as well. I won't go into that, but it's it's uh, um, stitching back your output uh, data that is tiled. And also out, it's also uh, stitching together the restarts with that restart true um, as a post um, run step. Has some other options in the config.yaml, probably not that, some MPI options. Um, and it has these user scripts. So that's that means that if it runs on, if it runs into an error, it, it uh, calls this special script called resub, and that's just so that it can it, it can um, resubmit some of the larger jobs. Sometimes call, uh, trip have an error for no particular reason, or at least it's one that isn't to do with a model, but to do with the queue. Or NCI, and we can res we can safely resubmit under some conditions. So that just means that our run, our run keeps on going, and um, and then if and if it runs successfully, then we just we that just is a little counter file to make sure that we only do a certain number of resubmissions before we give up. Doesn't matter. And this one that's um, that's uh, commented out is is at the end of the run, actually at the end of collation, this is the sync data, but it's not it's not uh, done by default. You have to uncomment that to make sure that you don't uh, copy off your data over an existing uh, experiment. If you want to restart from another experiment, Payo will use any existing restart directory in the archive. So um, 
the other, the other way of doing it is to use the restart option in config.yaml. You can just do restart colon and then a restart directory, but that doesn't work for the access OM2. There's a bug. Uh, so you, if you do want to start from another experiment, you have to copy or link pre, a previous restart and output directory pair into your archive. You should see the access OM2 wiki for details because it's a little bit, there's a few number, a number of steps. And if you need some help, please let me know. But it's, it's really quite simple. You just just trying to give it an output and a restart directory to find uh, so that it, it can just restart from them. Um, has my model crashed? Signs that your model has crashed, your work directory is still present in the control directory, even though um, the job's not running on PBS anymore. Um, and also your PBS output uh, files have appeared in the directory, um, which shows that it's finished. If your access OM2 and access OM2 dot out and dot er files are still present in the control directory and it's finished, that's another sign that something bad's happened. Or if you had a non at zero exit status in your PBS log file, this one in this case is exit status one, then that means um, your job has not, did not finish correctly. Uh, to diagnose a crash, look in the access OM2 error file, look for things like this, fatal errors. Um, there will be one, there will be an error. This is called a backtrace or a stack trace. Um, there is, it should be one of those for every single CPU. So the bigger the model, the more CPUs you get bazillions of them. Some of them will be useful. Some of them will just have, be because the model has died and the MPI has told the other um, CPUs, the other um, processes to, to kill themselves. So it's usually the first one that's the one that's useful. And, and um, the model has been compiled so that you get useful information in there. So it should tell you the name of the routine the, the line number and and the um, source code, the name of the source code file it came from. So that will help you track down errors. Um, that's one error. Another example, this is a one salinity area out of range and it gives you a value and a, and a location in, in the model where, it's, where that happened. That's got, that gives a bit more information than just, but it also also tells you where it happened in the code. If the cause of the crash isn't obvious, you might have to dig into the log files within the model subdirectories in the work directory. So there is a subdirectory in each one of, for each model inside the work directory, and there will be log files in there. And sometimes that contains the information you need um, that is useful. Right, we're now into optional territory because it's 2 p.m. So I've gone over time. Um, if people want to leave this, um, this will, uh, the, the, the video will go up on YouTube. But I'll take. I'll just quickly go through through a few more of these things, uh, about two or three minutes, and take some questions for anyone who wants to stick around. I hope that's all right. So, um, other useful stuff: diagnostics. Only a fraction of the possible diagnostics and tracer fields are output. Um, or tracer fields. Anyway, tracer fields are output, but the diagnostics are output. Um, the MOM diagnostics are determined by the diag table, and that's generated programmatically. Again, details maybe from Andrew. Oh, that anyway. Um, I think there might be detailed in the inside the, the configuration, the control directories. The size diagnostics are defined in size underscore n dot nml. There's a new section for perturbations to add offset, offsets or scale the atmospheric forcing fields, either spatially or temporarily or both. That is currently under development still. There is uh, an alpha version, but it needs some tweaking. Um, so that is still under development, but it should be available within the next few weeks, I should think. Um, there's already access model um, to model data. Some is published in threads from NCI, but it's always preferable to access directly on disk. You will need to be a member of HH5, IK11, CJ50, and QV56 are the four projects you need to access data and also run the model. Um, the Cosma community provides uh, the Cosma cookbook, which is a database to find and, lo and load the Cosma data sets that are on disk. There's a Cosma recipes tutorial uh, with tutorials and uh, Co Cosma recipes repository with tutorials and documented examples. And also uh, the cookbook includes a data explorer tool to find and load those data sets. Um, I would highly recommend you use them if you need to uh, access the existing Cosma data. If you run the model and it's something that is of general use, then your data could also end up being copied to one of the locations that's, that is regularly um, indexed for this database. If you want to compile executables, 
perhaps we we won't worry about that contact us if you want to do that um and uh and that's the end um thanks very much